All right, so uh, today really um, it's about so overlapping data sets. And I'm just going to tell you, or try to briefly tell you if I can, uh, two stories from the lab. And that really just, you know, I'm really just going to try to drive home this point of overlapping data sets, right? So as we, as we began discussing yesterday, um, you know, when you generate a bunch of chip seq data, especially if you work with epigenetic modifications or, or histone modifications, but even transcription factors like Ross was showing you about, you know, often you want to ask, you know, when do they co-localize, right? So when can we define an active versus a poised enhancer or an active versus a poised or bivalent promoter, right? So, you know, so I'm basically going to try to tell you two sh short stories from, from work in the lab that kind of illustrates all of this data overlap. And you're essentially going to use the same tools over and over and over again. And, and really that's my goal today is just drive that point home. Uh, so, um, so how do we begin to determine this overlap of chromatin modifications? So one, obviously, right, you can just look in the browser, load your data, which you should be doing, right? Um, and you can just see that you start to see data overlap. Um, and so, you know, data visualization can give you great clues. And then I'll just, again, quickly revisit this idea of kind of either bivalency or poised regulatory elements as these are defined um, by histone modifications. Um, as chromatin states really aren't monovalent, they're multivalent. And frequently, though, we just talk about them in terms of bivalency. One or two marks, or two marks often together, help define something. Uh, so again, I'll give you a little bit of historical perspective. So we know that this H3K27 this forms these broad repressive domains, as we talked about yesterday. Um, and it can co-localize with K4 trimethylation uh, to define bivalent gene promoters. Or in some instances, it does overlap H3K4 monomethylation in these kind of um, proximal enhancer regions to give you a poised enhancer state, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, so the idea of a bivalent promoter, there were two papers, um, I think these are both in 2006, so one from Brad Bernstein when uh, he was with Eric Lander, and then there was another from, uh, totally blanking, uh, was it Amanda Fisher, or another lab. But basically there were two papers that came out the same year in 2006 that described using chip chip at the time. Um, this co-localization of H3K4 trimethylation and H3K27 trimethylation. And what Brad was able to show again was that when he saw these two marks co-localized at gene promoters in mouse embryonic stem cells, um, that these seem to be en enriched for developmentally uh, regulated genes with this idea that you've kind of put the promoter in this uh, poised chromatin state with the idea that once you, the embryonic stem cells receive some kind of signal, they're going to differentiate and some of those may become active and some will remain repressed, all right? So, yes? So, Christian Hanin, who's with Rick King Copenhagen, works well on Polycom, and his idea is that King 27 translation is, or Polycom binding is like the default if there's nothing else there. And he actually said a couple of years ago, maybe he's changed his point that, he believed this bivalent chromatin domain is just an artifact of something moving in and something moving out, and that there's a point being there somehow. Or, it's, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard, to, I mean, we can it's very controversial. Yeah, and then um, one of the things I'll, I'll show you at the, at the end, some work from our lab that in human ESLs that follows on some work that came out in the last two years in mouse ESLs is that you can start to lose these depending on the growth conditions in which you grow your embryonic stem cells. Um, but it, I, I mean, I think if you, if you think about developmental regulation, I mean, this idea of how you're going to, how are you going to set up the next stage? Um, the idea of poised regulatory elements, I think, s seems like an attractive idea of, of how you can then start to put programs into place before you activate them. Uh, and people have gone back to show, I mean, I think I showed you yesterday that, you know, SUS-12 and EED from even the initial paper are localized there. So if it's highly transient or something, then. No, I don't think that was But yeah, well, uh, and the, but then I think that also begs the question of why are they? Why is it there at those genes? Which I think is in, in the end whether they would be there or not, or um, should they be bivalent versus those that are just K twenty seven repressed? Um, it's still interesting to think about um, 
why you targeted a subset of genes. I think that to me that's the most interesting question out of it is why are a subset regulated by polycomb and other genes aren't. Um, so um, then after enhancers were determined by H3K4 monomethylation, um, several papers came out that said if you lacked the acetylation state, you were probably in a poised enhancer state. And Joanna Wasaka's group are the ones who showed that you also could find this uh, proximal um, enhancers could be marked by K27. And this is data from her lab from, the, from that Nature paper that showed um, these kinds of examples where you could see uh, H3K27 trimethylation um, ESLs are here. You can see the, in the, when they differentiate the cells, they have the monomethylation um, as do the ESLs, but then um, you still have the K27 in the ESL. So they seem to be in this poised state. And then when they differentiate them, uh, the NECs um, then acquire the acetylation, but the monomethylation was present in both. So again, this idea that the, the monomethylation may have already been there to mark these <coughs> proximal enhancers near these genes, and as K27 was removed with differentiation, the enhancers then became activated to drive gene expression. And they went on to prove this by doing reporter assays similar uh, to what Ross was showing you in zebrafish, to show that when they uh, drove GFP with some <coughs> of these enhancers, they didn't turn on until later in neural development, because these were neural um, lineage that they were differentiating their cells into. Uh, so kind of helping confirm this idea that um, they are enhancers and they don't come on until a later stage of development. <clears throat> so when you're going, in addition to loading your data into the browser, I think, you know, heat maps should become your friend. Um, it's, it's also kind of a great way to just explore ideas about things that are co-localized. So in this heat map, and I'll show you another one similar to it in a minute, if we took all of our monomethylation peaks and we just ask, you know, you, so then you can just start to, at those sites that you've already called peaks in, you can just load in ChIP-seq data <laughs> and cluster them all together to ask, do they coincide or how frequently do they coincide before you move forward to do all of your kind of peak overlapping analysis that we'll get to in a moment. So you can make use of heat maps just to, once you have one mark, if you're focused on, to ask, so in this example, these are enhancers, so we don't expect the promoter mark. We expect many of them to be acetylated. And we asked if, you know, do they also have DNA's hypersensitivity data? Um, so a tool that's become, I alluded to this tool yesterday, a tool that's become popular in our, in our lab and is, does, um, Ross and James and I, I think we're talking a little bit about this yesterday, was Deep Tools. So there's a Galaxy version of Deep Tools. <coughs> um, so as they've written this tool, it's, um, you can you run it at the command line or you can run it in Galaxy. And it has a lot of great functions. Uh, so you can use the BAM coverage option to convert your BAMs directly to bigwigs. So loading them into the browser after that. Um, you can also use it to normalize your chip, chip seek reads. So when you run Max, it's going to, I think it you know, randomly takes 10 million reads from your data sets and kind of dis and outputs that for your uh, data visualization. Uh, the other way is to actually so that way you have an equal read depth, right? And I'm, I guess I didn't talk about this yesterday, but you should be aware that you know, if, you've, if you, you know, let's say you're chipping your favorite transcription factor in two different cell types. Um, if you sequence the second cell type, you know, 100 million tags and the first cell type 10 million tags, and the peak looks bigger in the second experiment, well, it's because you have just sequenced more tags at that site. So you need to normalize for that read depth. So one way is just to randomly take equal number of, read, of reads from each experiment so that you can easily quantitate the peaks, or you can actually use um, you know, one, either um, RPKM or RPM, so just reads mapped per million, to normalize for read depth. And so um, within Deep Tools, there's a function to normalize for you. So that's really useful too if you want to load your data into the browser and you want to make sure that the two data sets that you're comparing to each other aren't skewed by the fact that one was sequenced a lot deeper than the other. <clears throat> and this can also help you when you're, if you've normalized to read depth by either taking an equal number of reads or normalizing to RPKM or RPM when you're generating things like heat map and looking for differences in signal intensity. And then 
as you you can use deep uh, deep tools to then generate these heat maps and then it'll give you these nice little profiles around your regions of interest whether they're transcription start sites or the centers of your peak uh, so it's a it's a pretty nice tool to to get used to um, <coughs> All right, so I'm going to try to run through two different stories from the lab, uh, again, to really drive home this idea of just overlapping data sets. So I'll tell you about a, a paper that we, we um, this is published data from a couple years ago, and we began collaborating with a group that were working in T cells, and they were differentiating naive T cells, and so we wanted to look at very early time points as these cells differentiate to uh, T1 versus, or TH1 versus TH2, so two different populations of T helper cells. Uh, and we just, you know, Initially, we wanted to also, you know, just ask some basic questions about how enhancers drive transcription. So how many enhancers are cell type specific at these very early stages of differentiation that distinguishes the two classes? And then you know, because we're starting with a progenitor cell type, uh, you know, could we find things like poised enhancers? Um, and then you know, what are the motif, you know, kind of just standard questions. Can we ask what's binding by looking at motif analysis? So predict what's binding our enhancers in these populations. And then we wanted to ask, you know, do these enhancers overlap disease-associated SNPs? Um, and then even more specifically, I'll show you that we tried to ask, do they specifically overlap at a transcription factor binding site motif? Um, so this was just kind of the experimental design. We took human naive T cells and polarized them to TH1 or TH2 or just simply activate them to get them dividing uh, and generated, um, I'll tell you about these data sets actually, we won't really talk about this one today. And right, so you just, again, you can load them into the browser and start to look for cell type specific um, enhancer peaks and you can find them distally or intronically, kind of the things you expect. Um, and it, so at this point, right, you want to start to ask if you want to define enhancers in an active versus a poised state. Um, we also wanted to ask, are these sites hypersensitive? So there wasn't hypersensitive data at our 72 hour time point, but there was hypersensitive data available if you fully polarize the cells to seven days to ensure that they've com completely committed to their lineage. Um, and so then this is just a snapshot of, of K4 monomethylation peaks that were specific to TH1 cells, and then we could see that a subset of them were in an active state, but a large number of them were still in this poised state, and a few of those we sh you can see here actually go on to become hypersensitive. So our hypothesis then is that these up here where they're in this kind of active chromatin state and remain hypersensitive seven days later are probably active enhancers throughout this time course of committing to the lineage whereas some of them are in this poised state but become active later and these it's, we're kind of unsure were they enhancers that are they being decommissioned are they going to become active did they become active at some point that we missed because there's a big gap um, there's still some unanswered questions there, right? But then you can quantitate all of these different categories by simply you know, doing your various overlaps of when monomethylation overlaps acetylation, when it doesn't overlap acetylation, and then so forth. So how are you going to do all of these different kinds of, of overlaps, right? So that's going to come in these kind of peak, peak, what I call peak, peak comparisons. Um, so the way we do this in the lab is actually a tool that once you start moving to the command line that you probably are going to become very comfortable or at least familiar with, if not comfortable, uh, which is bed tools. And bed tools is really fantastic. There's you know, just a ton of different subcommands uh, for converting files, determining genome coverage, merging files together. Um, if you need to shuffle to do some, some random permutation, you can shuffle your data. Uh, but one of the tools that, you're, that, that gets used a lot is this, this idea of kind of either merging and then there's a merge function and then this intersect. And then there's a couple different options for the way you can intersect your data, right? So shown here, so if there's two different data tracks, so imagine you have one histone modification here and you have a second histone modification indicated as B, uh, you can ask where, does, where do A and B intersect? You can maybe imagine this is, in blue we have H3K4 monomethylation, maybe in B we have acetylation, right? And so you would like to know, you might want to know only the regions that, um, that directly overlap. This would give you some idea of percentage of your monomethylation peaks that are acetylated, right? You could then be able to calculate that. Uh, or maybe you just, you just simply want to know if, you know, if, if B overlaps with A, just output A, right? You just want, I want a list of all my monomethylated enhancers that are acetylated. And I don't care, you can set the overlap to be 
some fraction. It could be one nucleotide, 10%, 25%. You can kind of set what you want it to output, right? How much overlap, and then it will just give you back A, right? Um, and so you have, you, get, you have a lot of different options then for kind of how you set up these kind of intersection analyses to get either all of one back if it overlaps B or just the regions that overlap B so that you can calculate percent overlap. Um, and so this can come very useful if you're looking at very broad domains that partially overlap other um, histone modifications. Um, <coughs> so, and then um, for those of you that have started using Homer, there are some tools in Homer, Merge Peaks, to kind of look at these things. Um, so you can start to play around. It's in the printout, so I'm not going to go into too much detail. <coughs> Sorry, detail. Um, and then there's also, uh, you know, you can also do a subtract function. So again, it's, 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 it's somewhat like the previous example, but you can run it and, you know, instead of telling which part of A you want to output, you can simply subtract B from A and output that as well. Uh, so that you get all the regions of B that don't, or sorry, all the regions of A that don't overlap B. So again, if you wanted to know, if you have some broader modification and you want those regions that don't seem to be overlapping acetylation, you want to parse your um, modifications into particular sites, or if you maybe B are hypersensitive sites and, I don't know, you want to subtract those away or vice versa, um, one or the other. Maybe you want B to be the hypersensitive sites and you want to subtract away, you know, regions of A that aren't hypersensitive so that you don't focus on those parts of the peak. <clears throat> so it's, it, it's a very useful um, tool and you can do it, it can help you just kind of do a lot of different analyses. And really the two stories I'm going to tell you are really, I mean, essentially just about using overlap analysis to come to all of these, um, to answer these questions about what kind of chromatin states uh, these regulatory elements are in or if they're overlapping um, genetic variants. Um, so after we were able to find enhancers in a cell type specific manner or even shared enhancers, uh, one of the things we talked about yesterday um, were finding nucleosome free regions. And so I'm going to show you how we did that. And then we took these nucleosome free regions within the chromatin data and then did a motif analysis. So how might you find nucleosome free regions? We talked about this a little bit yesterday, but the idea again, remember, is that if you're chipping for these histone modifications, the tags that you sequence and map to the genome um, should start to align with the nucleosomes themselves or the ends of the nucleosomes, but should have some depletion of signal in a nucleosome free region where the transcription factors are binding. And again, this information is often lost because we smooth, when we make these WIG files, we kind of smooth our chip seq data. You extend the read to the length of your fragmentation size. But if you just plot tag, high, high tag density, you can actually start to make out nucleosome resolution. And so then you can start to find nucleosome free regions. So even when your, um, say your enhancer modification, if you just did this simple overlap tool would tell you this enhancer is shared across three different cell types. But what I can find is that, but within that shared enhancer, I can find cell type specific nucleosome free regions. So you may have cell type specific binding of a transcription factor at one region of the enhancer where other regions are co-bound uh, by a common set of transcription factors. <clears throat> and so this doesn't, uh, I guess, display very well. I lifted this, I think, straight from um, the Homer website. So one of the functions in Homer does the same thing. It tries to plot your chip seq signal. And this is what, um, this is basically what Lisa was talking about yesterday when you kind of get this doublet here. So you get one kind of stronger peak and then a second stronger peak here in blue. And then it tries to find, so again, these do start to look like 200 base pair intervals, right, of your chip seq signal. So then it tries to find the strongest nucleosome free region in your histone modification track. And so if you want to do a motif analysis to try to predict where transcription factors might be binding within these broader histone modifications, um, this might be one approach that you want to take so that you're not trying to find motifs in a 1.5 KB region. Right? Um, and so again, that's just how you do it in Homer. Uh, so next, 
once you've identified those nucleosome free regions, in our T cell paper, we actually did it, as I mentioned yesterday, using a, an approach from Shirley Liu's lab. Uh, there's a tool for doing it. Um, but there, I think it's command line only, so that's why I've given you the Homer option if you want to try it. Um, but there's a number of tools for motifs, again, because you guys have been introduced to Homer. There is, a, a, you know, again, there's Perl scripts for doing both known and de novo motif analysis. So you can take your nucleosome free regions you've defined and then now move on to the motif analysis uh, and find and look for regions that are enriched. And Homer is going to give you some output, right? So there's the motif itself. It's going to tell you uh, the p value enrichment, how many target sites uh, versus your percent of background, uh, and then what it thinks are the best matched motifs, right? So you can get all of this out in a nice um, HTM, HTML table. And um, so, when we, um, so when we did this, um, and again, you don't have to use Homer. You can use meme suites. or There's a, there's a variety of tools, once again. Uh, I guess I could have used my more than one way to skin a cat picture. But uh, there's a variety of tools for doing motif analysis. You, you don't have to use this one. Um, so you know. We tried to do this as well once we were able to identify uh, TH1 and TH2 specific enhancers, um, which were just a subset of the enhancers. There are a lot of shared enhancers at, the, at these early stages of, of differentiation between these two cell types, but we could find uh, thousands of cell type specific enhancers. We then took those cell type specific enhancers and did a motif analysis and tried to get an idea of what might be binding. And luckily, we started to see things that made sense, uh, things like ATF3 being in TH1 um, and STAT6. So STAT6 is a, is a known marker for the TH2 lineage. And so we could start to see enrichment of particular lineage-specific transcription factors within our ChIP-seq data sets. And so that's really comforting. And the other thing I would just remind you is to always filter your transcription factor motifs against your expression data, right? With the idea of, you know, you're always going to get more than one high-scoring motif at your enhancer transcription factor, DNA's hypersensitive site, right? It's just going to happen that way. You're looking at a window still of, you know, two to four, 500 base pairs, you're gonna get more than one motif that's highly enriched. So, you know, if in T cells, if I get, you know, I don't know, uh, some transcription factor like OCT4 coming up <laughs> that's not expressed, then that's not biologically interesting or relevant, right? It's probably just that, I mean, you can find a lot of motifs anywhere. Uh, some enhancers may be, you know, utilized more than one time in different cell types. Um, so if you want to gain some biological insight, we always, you know, filter for transcription factors that are actually expressed in our cell types of interest. Because what's the point of telling you that, you know, at this enhancer, one of the top three motifs was something like OCT4 if it's not expressed, right? It's not going to bind. <coughs> um, so shortly after we built, you know, the, the first genome-wide enhancer maps based on H3K4 monomethylation, then, you know, we said that, you know, now we can finally do what a lot of people have, have, have suggested is we could then start to ask, um, once we know where enhancers are, can we find variants at these enhancers that may disrupt transcription factor binding, and, you know, and specifically looking and thinking about disease-associated variants, right? Um, so why might you be interested in enhancer mutations or variants that are occurring at enhancers? So here's some extreme examples of enhancer mutations. I'll, get, I'll show you two examples uh, from model systems where the enhancers are deleted. Um, so this is actually um, becoming Lisa's favorite model organism, the stickleback. <laughs> uh, so this is an enhancer that drives uh, pit X expression and pit and um, it's, there's no mutation in the gene. This is an important developmental transcription factor. So if you were deleted, I believe it's embryonic lethal. But there's, a, there's an enhancer that drives pit X expression in um, the fin on the lower level here where the arrow is pointing to. And in one, um, I don't know if it's a subspecies or what they're called in, in stickleback, how different these two are. Uh, but there is a deletion of an enhancer element near the <coughs> pit X gene, and they no longer have this fin. Right? So deletions or mutations of enhancers are important. And then here's another example of a human-specific enhancer deletion. So there's a human-specific enhancer. So here's mouse, macaque, and chimp. There's an enhancer as indicated here by these red triangles. This is deleted in humans. It's next to the androgen receptor gene. 
And for better or worse, the loss of this enhancer leads to the loss of penile spines. So another example of you know, how deleting an enhancer element can have a dramatic phenotype. Um, but there are examples of, of mutations with enhancers that, that, are, um, that have been shown to be causative of disease, so eye disorders, deafness, polydactyly, right? So this is the class, one of the classic enhancer examples that's always given. Oh, there's a sonic hedgehog enhancer that's a megabase away, and it's in the intron of another gene, and it drives he hedgehog expression, right? Well, if you get a mutation in that enhancer, you get polydactyly, just like if you get um, you know, so there's several ways you can get polydactyly, but that's one of them, right? So enhancer mutations are important for development and, and disease. Um, so we simply, working in T cells, we just simply ask, and we only focused on the lead SNPs. Um, we didn't take all um, linked SNPs. We just took the lead SNPs from the primary studies, just downloaded the table, and did, again, an overlap analysis. So when was the lead SNP that is associated with the disease? When did they overlap our enhancers and came up with a list of, of autoimmune disease-based um, disease-associated SNPs that fall at our enhancers with the idea of, so people have shown that these SNPs are just statistically significantly associated with causing one of these diseases, such as type 1 diabetes or rheumatoid arthritis, but they're sitting out in the middle of nowhere, right? They're not in a gene, right? So it turns out if you do these kinds of analyses, and we're not the only ones who have done this, you can find that there are more disease-associated SNPs and enhancer elements than there are at genes. And so, you know, so we could find hundreds of SNPs and it was a broad range in our T cell types. That's what we found and that was just looking at the lead SNPs. I've gone back and redone this analysis and this number goes up if we use uh, additional SNPs that are in LD. Um, and so, I guess this doesn't, I don't know, it's probably hard to see. So then in addition to just asking was it an enhancer, we also asked more specifically, again, so just doing another overlap analysis, is, it, is the SNP not only at the enhancer, but is it within one of our predicted motifs, right? So with this idea that this might start to give us some insight as to how the SNP could cause the disease. So might it disrupt transcription factor binding? So based solely, you know, just on our motif analysis and these little stars that are at the top of the motif tell you where the SNP is. Uh, and then, so here is kind of the motif, here's the, the disease associated SNP, here's the cell type. Uh, Here's the variant that's associated with the disease, and then here is whether or not it fell within a transcription factor binding site motif, and then what that transcription factor was, or that's kind of here, and then we tried to predict uh, the putative target of that enhancer. Um, so, <clears throat> so kind of in summary, uh, you know, you can identify enhancers, you can determine whether or not they're both monomethylated and acetylated by doing these overlap analyses. You can determine if they're overlap or not between cell types. You can find nucleosome free regions, use that to focus your motif analysis, and, do, and um, then you can also ask not only do disease associated SNPs overlap your enhancer, but do they fall within your motif itself? Um, and data I didn't, that's actually in the paper that I'm not showing you, is that we actually functionally validated several of those motifs. So, based purely on our motif analysis, we did a DAPA assay to ask does a transcription factor bind? To, based on the prediction, and then was it disrupted by the SNP? And we show several examples in the paper where a single SNP does actually disrupt transcription factor binding. Uh, but what I thought was more remarkable was the fact that just based on our motif analysis, we could show that the transcription factor was binding the site. Uh, so focusing your, your motif analysis and getting the best candidates for binding, I think, really pays off. Um, so kind of, again, just a summary for this section is just, you know, so overlapping histone modifications with each other, I think, help kind of best defines their the state that the regulatory element is in. And I think it's essential for any, time, any kind of comparative analysis, either across time points or cell types. Um, and these kind of comparative analyses, you know, really provide some insight into cell fate and kind of transcriptional regulation of the cells you're interested in. And, and overlapping is really, you're just limited to the data sets you have at hand. Uh, yes? Are there any examples of a clear mechanistic connection between uh, and the and Yeah, so in that review article paper I showed you of like all those different diseases, <coughs> those, are, those are known causative mutations. But what I mean is that, so now you found at the molecular level that there's disruption of, or possibly disruption of um, enhancer function. Are there follow-up experiments at the cellular level looking at how that Cause through biochemical mechanisms. 
Yeah, so that's a good question. I mean, I know in some of those, like for the polydactyly one, I think the, the mouse model has been made and you can see that, you know, sonic hedgehog expression is also just reduced in the limbs. Um, but I can't, maybe I can't think of a great example other than that maybe as to, like, if you wanted to go back to lab and do this. So, right, how would I show, you know, so now I have a set of, you know, putative enhancer mutations um, that cause type 1 diabetes, but how would I model that or how would I test that? Um, so now you found additional evidence that the SNPs that people have found by another method is a genome wide association study of the search also happens to have this feature that it's an, in an interesting study in the genome. Yes. Does that help you figure out how? So I think it does. So, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you kind of some, some idea of, of how we're going to approach or how we're following up the type 1 diabetes and the rheumatoid arthritis study. So one, I know the enhancer, right? So I can continue to do these DAPA assays and ask which transcription factors are most likely to be disrupted, right? So that gives me a, an idea maybe of the transcriptional regulatory network that's at play here and, and how it's, you know, how if these factors can't bind, they can't turn on the right genes. And I can try to get an idea of, of what kind of regulatory network is disrupted from the transcription factors themselves. But ultimately, people want to know the gene, right? So the next assay that we've started setting up is actually high c capture. So you perform high c to find all promoter, enhancer, or insulator interactions, but you capture for sites of interest. So you can either capture for your enhancers or capture for promoters and find all of these interactions. So our goal is to find the target genes of all of these enhancers uh, just in a normal genetic background so that we know what their, their target should be, uh, and then go back to patients that have these genotypes uh, that we can get through a collaborator, and then either ask, are those target genes, is it, at, at least at the expression level, do we see changes in expression? Um, but even just finding the target genes, once again, you can imagine some kind of network analysis that you might want to do that tells you, if I find all the target genes of all the enhancers that harbor these SNPs, it's probably not, again, a single enhancer mutation is causing the disease, but you have more than one of these in a genetic background, but you obviously don't have all of them. And so how many target genes might be disrupted in any given individual, and how might that lead to disruption of T cell function? I think that's one way to start uh, down that path. Can I chime in? Uh, so this is, this is, first of all, I, I'm so glad that, that you brought out when I kept telling myself but what Manhattan brought out was that one of the driving reasons for trying to find these uh, candidate regulatory regions is because there's some huge enrichment yeah. of the phenotype associated SNPs in, in, in regulatory regions. And, and it used to be people say, oh man, this is unsolvable. You're out in some desert. Uh, it's, it's a coding desert, but it's, but, but it's not a regulatory desert. And a great example, I think this might be a good example of what you're asking about, <clears throat> were studies around Nick. So Nick actually is sitting in, uh, there's about, uh, about a megabase upstream with no well-characterized coding sequences and, 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 and also downstream. But it's a real hot spot for the GWAS studies showing susceptibility to breast cancer, to prostate cancer, so that, that region, AQ24, kept coming up over and over again. And thought, uh, okay, it was going to be next. It's going to be the coding region, because yeah. we know it's a proto-oncogy. Well, that's not where the variants were. They were, you know, 100, 200 kb up over here and over there. And uh, uh, there's a beautiful series of papers, I think 2008, 2010, uh, 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 folks who focused in on that region doing a chip chip across that, that, that region, you know, and, and found likely regulatory regions. And it turns out there was one place, is a binding site for TCF, TCF7L2, I think it's, it's, okay. this is a factor that comes up a lot in, in some of these uh, uh, diseases. And they went on to show uh, allele-specific binding by that, that protein, and there's, and I don't know how strong these data really are, but the paper was one of these uh, uh, three C studies, yeah. that, you know, actually arguing that the, the, the lesser binding interfered with the looping. So that, that, that might be one of the better characterized yeah. examples. And 
scores, if not thousands of labs are, are thinking, that's going to be the story for my phenotype too, right? So, so yeah, you know, I mean, I think this has become kind of, you know, a, a, a go-to kind of analysis. I mean, ENCODE has already done a lot for you, or, or the, the, you know, whether Manolis did it as part of ENCODE or the roadmap, right? There's basically every cell type that there's hypersensitive sites in or chromatin data, they took every single variant from the entire, you know, NHGRI GWAS catalog. So most likely this has already been done for your favorite disease and maybe even, you know, your favorite cell type. The analysis has potentially but, been done for you. That's, yeah. Well, I hope it's low hanging fruit. It's certainly worth trying to harvest. Yeah. And that's also a good point about this idea of, you know, so if you can, you know, do you, can you find that it SNPs disrupt transcription factor binding? And then if you know the target gene, does that disrupted binding also lead to disrupted looping interaction to drive gene expression? Presumably that's how it would have to function, right? Um, so yeah. Um, and then, um, you know, again, just one of the things once you've found peaks, um, you know, so you may want to look at kind of what's nearby. Uh, so again, because these enhancers are distally and people, if, if you're not doing something like 3C or 4C or high C or high C capture, uh, it's, 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 you know, the next best approach is just to approximate what you think the target gene is. And people have basically just rely on the nearest neighboring target gene. And there's lots of examples that already show that the nearest neighboring target, the nearest neighboring gene is not the target, but it's still a common analysis to be done. And you could try to correlate changes in, in, in hypersensitive sites or chromatin marks with changes in gene expression of the nearest target gene to kind of, you know, reassure yourself that that's what you've done. And one of the ways you can do this again is you can take the Homer pipeline and you can use this annotate peaks function. And essentially it just takes your peak file and finds the nearest neighboring gene for you and outputs what that gene is, right? And then you can do some kind of go analysis to ask if, if your cell type specific enhancers are near genes that are expressed in a cell type specific manner or do some kind of pathway analysis or go analysis. You can also do this in great will also do this uh, for you. So it will find the nearest neighboring gene and do the go analysis on you all in kind of one pipeline. Uh, but it's a pretty common tool, but it, I mean, just everyone I think would, uh, would acknowledge that it's not necessarily the target of your enhancer or your distal regulatory site, but it's at least the first place to look. Also, great, and you can set it to look on either side, right? Yeah. And look at different distances and include multiple genes, whatever. That, of course, dilutes the GO analysis a little bit. Yeah. It does, there's a lot of things that are actually built into this. And I think also they have all of the chip seek data to also for like transcription factors now to tell you if a transcription factor is likely to be bound to your site if you're not doing a transcription factor chip seek. So if you were doing hypersensitive or assay or just chromatin modifications, they would tell you whether or not that site has been shown to be bound by a transcription factor chip seek, even if it maybe have been in another cell type. I believe that's all built into this now. Um, so again, there's just a lot, I mean, once you kind of get your data sets, you're going to spend a lot of time uh, using these kind of merge and intersect functions, whether you're doing it in Galaxy or bed tools. And this is kind of how you're going to get to all this information. It's just overlap after overlap after overlap. And I'll continue to illustrate this with, you know, just one more short story from the a lab, or from the lab, a story that's kind of ongoing. Um, and so one of the things that my lab focuses on is um, looking at epigenetics in human embryonic stem cells. Um, because I think it's a, it's a great place. Um, the stem cell system is, is a great system for kind of, you have this ability to create, you know, s both cellular and epigenetic dynamics, right? Because you can differentiate the cells and ask how the epigenome changes, right? The underlying genome is the same and the epigenome is dramatically different. Um, and so it's, it's, I think it's a really great system for trying to understand how modifications change and how that relates to changes in transcriptional regulation. Um, but one of the things that's kind of emerging in the stem cell field is that, um, is this idea of can we use embryonic stem cells, I think, to represent different stages of early embryonic development, right? And one of the things to always keep in mind is that if you, if you look at mouse versus human development, um, you know, they are both different in terms of timing of when things happen. So for example, um, 
you know, at the two cell stage in mouse is when you have zygotic genome activation, but in human that happens somewhere between four and eight cell stage. So, you know, somewhere in here, these cells are totipotent, but later on, this inner cell mass here is the pluripotent cell, right, that gives rise to the three germ layers. So that happens much later in human development than it happens in um, mouse development. Also, these cells that, when you're, that are going to go on to give rise to the trophectoderm or the placenta, uh, these CD, CDX2 positive cells, so you know, this is already forming around two, two and a half to three days, but it's actually quite late in human development. And in fact, even at the marula stage, you can find uh, work from Janet Rassant and others have shown that you can find CED2, or CDX2 and TED4 positive cells within this inner cell mass and maybe even signs at the early, still in the early blastocyst stage that say you have cells that are going to commit to that lineage and they haven't quite done so yet. So they're still intermingled within this population. So there, there's some clear developmental differences between the human and mouse. Um, and I think that's important to bear in mind because we've always known that human and mouse embryonic stem cells are slightly different and whether or not that was a developmental difference or just a species specific difference it was kind of just not talked about or overlooked or just chalked up to being species specific difference. Um, and of course for mouse during these early time points we've learned a lot about epigenetics in terms of like DNA methylation, in terms of resetting that aspect of our epigenome, but for those of us that do chip seq on histone modifications, studying human, early human development is, or mouse development is almost possible from the chromatin perspective because you can't chip two, four, eight, or 36 cells. Um, but what people have shown to be happening in early development is shortly after fertilization, we do know from staining of, of both human and mouse embryos that modifications such as H3K4 monomethylation dramatically increases. Um, acetylation of histones dramatically increases uh, as you're in these early stages of human development. Um, and so coming back to this idea of embryonic stem cells representing different stages of early mammalian development, so mouse embryonic stem cells are, are isolated from this blasto early blastocyst uh, stage. Um, and of course, this is where most of the work is focused and showed that they are pluripotent. You can make all the germ layers and you can make a mouse. Uh, then in 2007, a couple papers came out where they isolated embryonic stem cells from this post-implantation epiblast. And while you can culture them in the dish uh, and get them to differentiate, they are highly ineffective at actually making a mouse, which is the truest test of pluripotency, right? Can you actually give rise to the whole organism, not just the germ layers? Um, and these epi, so they called them epi-SCs because they're from the epiblast instead of the blastocyst. And one of the things people noticed was, you know, we had seen, we, everyone knew there's morphological differences and culture condition differences between mouse and human embryonic stem cells. And these cells grow in conditions like human ES cells and they look like human ES cells. And so then it really started to beg the question of what stage, not only what stage of development do human cells represent, but just how pluripotent are they? And so I think the field is evolving to, you know, really try to think about can we grow cells in different conditions and get them to represent different stages of development. There are several papers now that have shown that in mouse ES cells at least, uh, you can find a rare population of cells that are 2C, what they call 2C-like. So they seem to represent this two cell stage. So to me, this really does, I think, represent an opportunity to try to study uh, earlier or a spectrum of development in mouse and human using embryonic stem cells as kind of a model system. Um, so human cells, again, most human ES cells seem to represent this epiblast stage, this post-implantation. Um, but several years ago, people began trying to grow human ES cells in conditions that seem to represent uh, this the mouse ES cells. And so the terms that have emerged in the field are that embryonic stem cells from the blastocyst stage are naive or pre-implantation, and those that represent uh, the epiblast are primed or post-implantation. So I'm going to use naive and primed in the next uh, few slides to tell you about some data we've been working on. Uh, so one of my colleagues at UW uh, derived one of the first naive human embryonic stem cell lines. So it's not pushed back in development, it's actually derived under naive conditions. And so 
since as a postdoc, I'd spent quite a bit of time generating epigenetic maps in human embryonic stem cells, this looked like a great system for a comparative analysis. And then we can also start to push these cells forward towards the prime state uh, to a stage we call pre-primed um, because we don't think they're fully primed, at least under the time and conditions we're growing them. And we did kind of a standard, take our five favorite histone modifications and chip them. Right? So this is all the work of a, a graduate student lab, Stephanie Battle. So again, the first thing you're gonna do in these kinds of studies is you're gonna just quantitate peaks. And so one of the really interesting things that jumped out uh, following the color from the other page where blue is uh, the, our naive cells, cyan are these pre-primed and this yellow orange are our prime cells. As you can see, there's a dramatic increase in H3K4 monomethylation, but things like the promoter modification don't really seem to change. And there's also this hyperacetylation in the naive epigenome uh, that isn't seen in uh, the primed epigenome. We also see, so we had already published the K27 trimethylation data and many other people have published this as well. Uh, so even in mouse cells, culture conditions shifted uh, to kind of a more naive state than most of all of the data that has been generated, epigenetic data that has been generated in mouse ES cells. So all that data was regenerated mainly by Hank Stunningbird's lab and a couple of papers of mouse cells grown in a more naive state. Uh, so one of the things that we've shown and others have shown is that as you shift from naive to prime, there's this increase in H3K27 trimethylation. So many of those bivalent promoters that were made famous don't exist in the naive state. Uh, and we can, while we can see K9 trimethylation on a western blot in our cells, we cannot call peaks. Uh, we can't get enough enrichment of K9 trimethylation in the naive state to call any peaks on it. And we couldn't call that many to begin with in the prime cells. And so, and that was really the point of a paper that we had published years ago when I was a postdoc that really used ChIP-seq to confirm a hypothesis that Iran Mashur and Tom Mastelli had proposed that ES cells are kind of in this more open chromatin state because when they stained cells, um, they didn't see very much heterochromatin. And it was this idea that maybe part of what defines pluripotency is that the cells exist in this kind of open chromatin state with the idea that you would have easy access to regulatory elements or to turn genes on that you might need. Once you're terminally differentiated, most of the regulatory elements in the genome are, and you know, more than half of the genes you don't need access to, right? You just need to function as you, the cell type you are. But at this early embryonic stem cell state, uh, you're going to go on to become many different things. And so uh, we were able to show by ChIP-seq that previously that these modifications are, you know, hardly exist uh, within that. Um, so really a more quantitative aspect of, of their earlier study. Um, the other thing we like to do is because histone modifications can vary in length and width, is also just plot, you know, percent of the genome that they cover. This also gives you an idea of if you're forming these kind of broad domains, potentially, if you look at the number of peaks you have versus percent of genome that you're covering. Um, and you'll see some examples of that. Um, so again, to, this, is, this slide is really to help illustrate this idea of just, you're going to do a lot of these overlap analyses, right? So Stephanie wanted to ask, you know, of all the different promoter states that she could think of, uh, and many of these terms come from the literature, we didn't come up with the terms, right? So active, uh, in the literature has been defined as K4 trimethylation and K27 acetylation, where some people have defined poised, and though it gets confusing, poised as the K4 only, K4 trimethylation only, uh, whereas bivalent is K4 trimethylation plus K27 trimethylation, and then of course we have K27 only unmarked. And we even asked could we find any cells or any promoters that had just acetylation but don't seem to have K4 trimethylation. Um, so um, that allowed Stephanie to generate this plot, which basically defines the chromatin state of genes uh, and put them into these um, categories, these six categories, and then ask how do those chromatin states change as we move from this naive to primed, uh, uh, these aspects of pre-implantation to post-implantation uh, representation of human development. And so, you know, the plots, you. There are ways to visualize this so you can actually follow single lines or trajectories if they go back up or if they go and continue on or they go and continue to some other state. But in order to identify all of these chromatin states, you know, after Stephanie called peak, she simply had to do all these different overlaps to ask, could she come up with these, 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 you know, how many different patterns could she come up with? And then that allows her to build a figure like this to ask about chromatin state transitions. 
Uh, so get familiar and get comfortable with kind of your overlap tools uh, as you're analyzing your ChIP-seq data. This, of course, allows us to ask questions again about enhancers. So we wanted to know, so as Ross pointed out yesterday, in human ESLs, uh, we had shown there really is this, this kind of more enriched than any other place, these monomethylation only poised enhancers, and it's quite abundant. Uh, it's about the same in the naive in terms of percent, it's about the same in naive cells, but we have nearly twice as many enhancers in the naive state versus the prime state. So we have twice as many act active enhancers in terms of acetylated enhancers and twice as many poised enhancers in terms of the monomethylation only. And again, you get to this information just by doing your overlap analysis of your histone modifications. Um, and this kind of gives you an idea of, of all of the um, naive enhancers, how many are present in the, this pre-prime state and then the prime state. So what's the overlap with those other cell types as we move forward in human development? <clears throat> and the other really interesting thing that, that Stephanie began to notice is, right, is she, just, she also just looked at size of the enhancers. Uh, so again, most of the enhancers are in just a few KB, um, which is what we've seen before. Uh, but now I think uh, after Rick Young's papers on super enhancers, you're almost forced to comment on whether or not you have super enhancers. Uh, <laughs> so if, for those of you that don't know, so um, just to describe what, so there's kind of two definitions. There's super and stretch enhancers. So I think the easiest concept is a stretch enhancer. A stretch enhancer as defined by, um, 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 I'm totally blanking. Um, well, the stretch enhancer is defined by a long region of H3K27 acetylation. So greater than 3KB or something like that, right? So very broad region of, of K27 um, ac acetylation, right? Super enhancers, um, are similar but slightly different. They were actually first defined by Rick Young as he, he stitched together transcription factor binding sites that were within 12 KB of each other. So that's a fairly broad distance to say that something 12, but many of those transcription factor binding sites were clustered um, fairly closely, but it does stretch as far as 12 KB away to the next uh, binding site. And he then, but he does show that those sites are also acetylated. So you do get very broad acetylation uh, regions across these sites. And then he was able to go on um, to show through some limited reporter assays that they had stronger activity. And so that's why they called them super enhancers. So many people um, have taken liberty of just using the stretch enhancer definition and just calling them super enhancers, but others have been, uh, have kind of stuck with looking at transcription factor binding first, do they see a clustering of transcription factor binding, and then looking at the chromatin structure around it and calling those super enhancers. Francis Collins lab, that's who I was thinking of, to find the stretch enhancers. Um, and so whether they're super or stretched enhancers, I think technically based on definitions, we can't call them super enhancers because we haven't looked at TF binding. Uh, but one of the things we've noticed is that there are some pretty amazing uh, stretch enhancers beyond the <coughs> size of what has been described in the other papers uh, previously for super or stretch enhancers. So um, on the, um, a lot of times people show something like, I, I think this analysis came from Nick Young's lab, it's like the, uh, it's the top X percentile of, uh, of, of regions by, I guess is it the length of the K? 27 assimilation or the total amount of K27 assimilation, something like that. And, and, and there's a program ROSA that you put up. So that, that's yeah, so they do have a tool that you can run that tries to define them for right. you. Um, but again, I mean, it, it, to me, I think taking the liberty to stitch something together that's 12 KB away is a little generous. So we haven't run their algorithm to do it. When we, again, like I mentioned yesterday, when we call peaks and stitch them together, they have to be within 200 base pairs of each other. Otherwise, it's a separate enhancer. So if we're calling something that's, and I'll show you the example. So when we call something that's 50 KB, it's because literally, I mean, yes, you can start to see some valleys, but pretty much either from max itself or max plus stitching together things that are less than 200 base pairs apart, we get something that's bigger than we've ever seen before. I, I, I like that graph because it, you know, it, it, that plateau is not zero. I mean, it, it, it's not 
Yeah, yeah, these are these are rare. These are very rare. They're rare, uh, but they're huge. Yes, but they're huge, and yeah, they're bigger than we've ever seen, um, yeah, which I think is, I'll comment on at the very end as to why I think that is. Um, but you know, one of the things, because again, we're looking at what we think is somewhat mimicking, um, you know, this transition from pre-implantation to post-implantation. But I mean, this could be any kind of differentiation time course or something like that. I mean, again, the beauty of stem cell systems is that we can also, if we looked at just what we thought were, what we called as, again, from an overlap analysis, naive specific enhancers so that we could find them in our naive cells but couldn't find, Max, you know, doesn't call them in the prime cells. And then we ask, we just ask, again, just by clustering without calling the peaks in the other cell types, right? So just by comparing these two lists, we come up with a set of what we call naive specific enhancers because they're not present in the prime state. And then again, this is made using, you know, Stephanie made this using deep tools. Um, this is kind of the standard output. You get these profiles of what your average signal intensity is. And then you can see how it's transitioning to become virtually non-existent in the prime state. And so this, we think, is giving us an idea of an enhancer decommissioning as we go, as we transition from this naive to prime state. And we don't really see a transition in, the, in this pre-prime state, except for some of these, you know, maybe some of these larger enhancers are kind of being overlapped. Uh, but if we look at what we're calling, so they're somewhat embedded or nearby these, I think is what we're getting here. But we can find things in the prime state that simply don't exist um, prior in development. Um, <clears throat> but again, so deep tools, it's in Galaxy, it's going to become your friend. Uh, and this is just again to emphasize, you know, this idea of these stretch or maybe super enhancers. And so you can see, again, the, the you know, so jokingly in the lab, we don't call them either. Um, because we started to find it's kind of, you know, what is, we couldn't really figure out a great definition. And some there's some liberties taken. So once Stephanie found that she had things over 20 KB and everyone walks downstairs to the coffee shop, these are in the lab are tall, grande, and venti. Because uh, <laughs> why not? Um, but again, you can see that some of these really large, you know, so the blue and red over 10 KB, over 20 KB just simply don't exist. So as you start to develop more and more and begin to come to the stage where you're about to give rise to the different germ layers, uh, you have what I would say is an even not as determined by repressive chromatin, but I would say you're losing an open chromatin structure because we just have, you know, twice the genomic coverage marked by monomethylation uh, in this naive state. And this is just a zoom in of, of those red and blue regions. So again, they are limited, you know, or, or a few thousand that are in this, or less than, a, less than 2,000 that are in this, um, kind of greater than 10 KB space. Um, but on, and then we also, you know, Stephanie looked again on average, if you, if you take just your, you know, super stretch enhancers, um, you know, bigger than, you know, 5 KB at least, you know, again, the definition is somewhat vague as to where you should start, three, five, seven. Um, most of the time, you know, if you have monomethyl, a, a stretch monomethylation, uh, domain, then you also have this stretch acetylation domain and there's a decent amount of overlap. And you can again see that here. If you build your heat maps in deep tools, you can just plot just the just um, regions that are really large and you can see that they're also acetylated. So right, so we just took these peaks and plotted the signal with it. Um, and here's just a browser shot. So this is probably the largest enhancer I've ever seen. It's over 50 KB long. Uh, interestingly, it is in an imprinted locus. Um, but this is one continuous call here. Uh, so uh, this is the H19 IGF2 region, and we get these very large enhancers called in this region. So max 1.4 can call very large chromatin domains. How do you call them? Max. So we, 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 ru we run max, uh, in, in, as I mentioned yesterday, and kind of under the histone settings. Um, and then we only stitch peak calls together if they're less than 200 base pairs apart. Um, so you really can start to call uh, these broad regions with it. Yes? So 
I don't, I don't know what to make of them. Well, I have an idea of what they are. Um, so in the original or couple of super enhancer papers that came out, uh, I think you know, Rick suggested that they are enriched near, you know, in the ES paper, I think it was near developmentally regu regulated genes or in the other cell types, it was near uh, like cell type specific or lineage specific regulators, I believe. So, they, so his idea was that they were, you know, they were kind of in close proximity to something that was really important for the cell type you were studying. Um, and then he did do a limited number of functional assays where you could take these big regions and show that they did have increased enhancer activity beyond kind of a standard enhancer. Um, and, you know, so again, we also see that they're largely overlapping with acetylation, but the, I don't have the acetylation tracks here. The acetylation tracks within these regions don't, they often, you know, look identical, but sometimes they, so here is the prime state down here, and these are the only enhancers we call in the prime state, one, two, three, four, five, uh, and then this is the naive state. But the acetylation is slightly less stretched, even in the stretched enhancer region. So to me, this is, this is really fascinating and, and kind of an early mammalian development with, again, this idea of what does it mean to be in, an, in, an, in a pluripotent state? or why do you, or how do you maintain an open chromatin structure? And so, given that we do know that after fertilization, there's a dramatic increase in monomethylation, it, it kind of reminds me of DNA methylation, right? So, during those first few stages of early development, you have to basically reset the methylome, right? The DNA methylome. And so this makes me think if at some point early in development, is there some reason we need to go through and mark or pre-mark important enhancers. So we've downloaded two million DHS sites from the ENCODE epigenome project. So I guess we still have the new list is probably up to four million. And you know, basically something like 97% of these are at some point are a hypersensitive site. So in some other cell type, they, they do overlap hypersensitive sites. So is this pre-marking of key um, regulatory elements or some reason as you're going to reset your entire epigenome during development? Do you need to mark certain regions uh, with chromatin so that they, so we're now building whole methylome maps to see what the methylation profiles look like here. But is that, so maybe this is how you don't methylate regions of the genome because you have positive or active chromatin marks in place. Or is this again just representative of how you're going to reset your epigenome to that stage it needs to be at as you become a human embryo, right? So that's why I think this is really fascinating to me, is that it, there's, there's implications for kind of epigenome reorganization during development and what's kind of happening as we reset the epigenome in that process. Um, and along those lines, one of the things that I wrestle with, with this concept of stretch or uh, super enhancers is, I mean, the nomenclature, the really prominent papers, are inferring that this is something new and different. And, and, it's an, and there's a discrete entity that is something new and different. And I keep wondering if, how do you know it's not just a cluster of things we already know about? Right, right? So, so, so you know, you, you have uh, 100,000 enhancers, and, and that they, they could come sufficiently close together yeah. that by some grouping algorithm, you know, that they're grouped. And, uh, and I haven't, I don't, is there any evidence that says that, 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 that they're anything more than the sum of their parts? So, I mean, this has, I think, been debated, right? I mean, there's a, sure. there's a preview from, I think, Jason Lieb and others, or just our editorial, that have discussed this, kind of how they're somewhat ill-defined and make that, I think, bring up that exact same question. Are they just a sum of their parts? So if you just put more transcription factor binding sites together, is it expected? You just, well, I mean, the more you load up transcription factors, isn't that probably what you expect in terms of enhancer activity? That maybe that there's a direct correlation with how it's, it, it's strength and the impact on expression. Um, and the, you know, the larger regions had been seen. It's just, I think nobody had named them and Rick is really good at pointing out small things that are obvious and turning it into you a fantastic story. Factor specificity by concentrating the transcription factor Well, so I mean, the transcription factor specificity is still driven by um, the, the underlying DNA sequence. But 
But if you have all these sequences that are close together that are also similarly similar to one another and recognized by different transcription factors, and now all of that region is now accessible to the transcription factor, could that mean that there's more could that mean that there's more crosstalk between the transcription factors at different binding sites in those regions? I guess that's a good question. I mean I don't remember from the original Super Enhancer paper, but I guess one could go back and ask. I mean, Rick does show again that there's multiple transcription factors bound, but whether there's less like conservation of their motif in those underlying regions because you just have this open, and it's also a chicken and an egg question, right? Do you have open chromatin structure that allowed all those transcription factors to come in? Or did you somehow allow, or did for some reason multiple transcription factors were able to stabilize in that region and that leads to, you know, an acetylated domain, um, right? Um, so that's a good question. Uh, we do now, our col or my collaborator who uh, derived the line does also now have hypersensitive data, DS1-seq data in these cells. So we can compare that to these regions to ask what's hypersensitive, where in these broad regions are they hypersensitive and what are the motifs to try to get an idea of the transcription factors that may be bound or do we also see broad hypersensitive regions that may suggest that there's some lack of specificity. So, I just remember some uh, Yes, you are right that Rick shows that there's an enrichment of chromatin remodelers, I think BRD4, and did he also show MED because you know he's also they've done a lot of work on mediator right is also enriched with this idea that I mean in the original paper when we chipped H3K for modern methylation we showed that mediator is localized to almost all those sites with the idea that NP300 to show that they were enhancers but you need mediator to help you loop in uh, that's why it mediates again if you're an enhancer if you're an enhancer you would expect to see and you have a broad chromatin domain, that chromatin domain had to be remodeled at some point and if it's functioning as an enhancer then you would expect to see things like P300 and mediator there. Uh, so I think that, that goes to Ross's point about... The it, are in, in, in isolated enhancers too. Yeah. Uh, Lisa, you had a comment? So that's, that's actually a really good question. So our collaborator had previously generated um, you know, array data when she derived the line and then she went back and her and another collaborator generated RNA-seq data. Um, but because it's, it was poly A selected, we have now gone back and generated a third transcription <laughs> or transcriptome data set so that we did a ribominus kit to try to address that. Um, do we see antisense RNAs or long non-coding RNAs, something being transcribed in these regions that kind of are also contributing to this open chromatin structure? For example, you mentioned the region, and that's just full of non-coding Yeah, so that's the region that I showed that largest super enhancer that we've ever seen. Yeah, yeah, and so there's, I mean, we definitely see some enrich, I've, I've looked at, after I saw that, I looked at other, because H19 is also highly, it's one of the top 10 transcripts um, when you compare naive to prime. Yeah. So that's what kind of drew me to that region. And then I saw this math, that's where Stephanie's 50 KB uh, stretch enhancer was. But so then I checked several other regions. Um, so like MEG3 looks kind of similar, but PEGs don't look like that, which is also interesting. Um, I, I haven't, ch we, haven't, we haven't done the imprinting gene analysis yet. Yeah. Right, so MEG3, right, it also has all of those um, microRNAs and others that are also in the region, so. It's the, the terminally expressed versus the terminally expressed, yeah. so the genes have different properties in that way. Yeah. Just one last really quick question, what about polymerase 2 association? So we haven't done any, we haven't done any PAL2 general or specific transcription factor uh, chip seek yet, um, but this project is now just ripe for all kinds of things like that, so. No, so we haven't done CAGE. I mean, we thought about also doing GrowSeq to try to find ERNAs. Um, so again, lots of cool things that I think we could do to try to understand this naive system that haven't yet been described. Um, and for some reason, nobody has described this enhancer state, in, in, even in the mouse ES 
naive system. I don't know how it was missed, but, um, but yeah. But again, I think, um, to me, I think one of the more exciting things, and you know, sometimes you can get in trouble when you say, you know, ESLs represent development, because <coughs> others just say, no, it's just differentiation. But I think, you know, there really may be some limited, but some opportunity to try to get an understanding of how um, chromatin is now reset and our epigenome is, 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 is reprogrammed or reset during early development, I hope at least. Um, so. But again, you get to all of these conclusions about these over, from basically doing your peak finding and doing a whole bunch of overlap analyses. Uh, so that's really kind of the big picture take home uh, for you guys. <coughs> all right, thanks.